Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on post-thrombotic syndrome, understanding the effects and implementing best practices for treatment. We have a very experienced and knowledgeable faculty this evening. I'm Dr. Paul Gagne. I work as a vascular surgeon in Fairfield County, Connecticut, part of the Vascular Experts. Dr. Kathleen Gibson is with Lake Washington Vascular Surgeons in Bellevue, Washington, on the other side of the country. Dr. Aaron Murphy, down in North Carolina, is the director of the Venus and Lymphatic Institute at the Sanger Heart and Vascular Atrium Health Center. And finally, Dr. Ronald Winokur is an associate professor of radiology and the director of Venus Interventions at Jefferson University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So I'd like to welcome the faculty and I'd like to encourage the audience to pay close attention to their uh, tidbits and uh, the information they passed on tonight. These are the disclosures of the faculty. This program is provided by North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, an HMP global company, and is supported by an educational grant from Medtronic. The learning objectives for this webinar are understand the effects that post-thrombotic syndrome or PTS can have on a patient's quality of life, Identify current commercially available and future treatment approaches for the treatment of PTS. Utilize stents in treatment of post-thrombotic syndrome when applicable. And finally, understand the post-procedural needs for a patient with post-thrombotic syndrome. I'm going to start this presentation with an introduction to post-thrombotic syndrome and just review what is going on in these patients and what is the pathophysiology of the disease and how does it impact a patient's quality of life? So we all know that deep vein thrombosis has two effects uh, on the venous system of patients. Not only does it develop into scar tissue and occlude veins, but it also can damage the venous valves. This is what thrombus looks like when you've removed it from an acute DVT patient. You see this very dense gelatinous material that not only fills the vein, but encases the valves. And as a result, not only do you have pain and swelling, but you get this chronic obstruction that starts to develop uh, where blood is flowing through perhaps channels, uh, if at all, but certainly the main highway is not open. And here you can see a good graphic representation of the thrombus in the valve and, and around the valve, uh, which due to inflammation from the acute DVT process can lead to scarring and sclerosis of the valve and malfunction. Now, in the US, there's 900,000 patients each year who suffer from either acute DVT or pulmonary embolism. And up to half of these patients with DVT will develop chronic problems. And this is a form of post thrombotic syndrome and can be represented by symptoms such as swelling, pain, skin pigmentation, and inflammation of the skin in the leg, as well as ulceration. Acute DVT is an inflammatory event. It can cause severe valve reflux due to sclerosis, as mentioned before, and the inflammation also causes scarring within the vein lumen that can lead to chronic outflow obstruction. This reflux and chronic obstruction leads to chronic venous hypertension, which then results for the patient in edema, tissue hypoxia, and ulceration. Proximal vein DVT involving the iliac and common femoral veins is particularly prone to developing the post-thrombotic syndrome in patients' limbs, with 30 to 70% of patients with extensive iliofemoral DVT developing post-thrombotic syndrome. If we look at the ATT&CT trial and ignore for a moment the effect of anticoagulation combined with thrombolysis, and look at the arm of patients who were treated with anticoagulation alone. These were patients who were entered into the trial with iliac, common femoral vein, femoral vein, and popliteal vein DVT. And they were treated with anticoagulation in the medical arm. And if you look at the outcomes in these patients, 48% of them had post-thrombotic syndrome at two years. And the post-thrombotic syndrome was moderate to severe in about a quarter of the patients. So patients who are being treated with anticoagulation alone have a significantly high and severe incidence of post-thrombotic syndrome. 
So if you think about all the patients that are out there who have had DVTs over the years, patients who have chronic post-robotic syndrome are significant in number. And if you look at the Kevin trial, you look at the five-year outcomes data, again, looking at the anticoagulation alone group, again, iliac, common femoral vein, and femoral vein DVTs, 71% of these patients had post-thrombotic syndrome. So the majority of patients who have an extensive DVT involving multiple vein segments, especially proximal in the leg towards the pelvis, are going to manifest some form of post-thrombotic syndrome. In the bottom left lower panel, you see what that acute DVT on the top left forms into. This is scar tissue, collagen within the vein, which is the chronic form of what develops from an acute DVT. You can see that there are synechiae or channels where blood can travel, but like the highway, flow is not normal. It's, 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 there's an obstruction element uh, and there's congestion. And this is another example of what that looks like. Again, on the panels on the left, the vein opened in a longitudinal fashion. Transversely, you see this block of obstructive collagen, uh, which is the vein in its chronic uh, occlusion state. You do have openings, sort of like a Swiss cheese configuration, but most of the lumen is occluded. And then finally, there is a more subtle form of post-thrombotic syndrome that can be clinically significant. You see here on the right, the normal common iliac vein, and you can see the vein here is shrunken with a web going right through the middle of it. And you can see here that the vein is about the same size of the artery, whereas in a normal state, the veins are typically larger than the artery. And again, you see here some scar in the lumen of the vein, the vein is contracted, not much bigger than the artery when compared to the more normal external iliac vein as shown here. So the post-thrombotic disease occurs in various shapes and forms from very obvious total occlusions to more subtle findings that can be clinically important. Here's a patient with essentially a near total occlusion. Uh, you see filling of the common femoral vein here with a, a small lumen of residual common femoral vein and external iliac vein and then robust collaterals from a chronic occlusion. These are the forms of advanced venous hypertension that we see in our patients. This patient here with hemosiderin deposition, he's got some inflammation of the skin and swelling and heaviness. This patient here has chronic stasis dermatitis with a breakdown of the skin locally and a sense of heaviness, and then a classic venous ulcer with inflammation wrapping around the leg and a contraction of the skin and soft tissue. Uh, these are the forms of, of chronic venous hypertension that our post-thrombotic patients may have. Now, the worst case scenario after an acute DVT is the patient who has both deep vein occlusive disease and deep vein valve reflux. This combination has the highest associated disability, Volalta scores, severe post-thrombotic syndrome, and PTS-induced venous ulceration. And these are some forms of what post-thrombotic syndrome can progress to. This patient, less severe with swelling and a sense of pain, maybe some skin inflammation. And then here, this patient with a severe wraparound ulcer who's weeping, you see the skin maceration here uh, and the chronic inflammation. This is the combination of obstruction and vein valve dysfunction. The variety of the presentation clinically, however, is quite fascinating. And then finally, it's an expensive problem. We see a lot of patients who have an acute DVT and some may die and some may have a silent PE, but you've got two groups, those with chronic pulmonary hypertension, and the bigger group, these patients here with post-thrombotic syndrome, who account for a large part of the cost of patients taking care of four VTE events uh, over, over the long term. And finally, the quality of life deterioration in the post-thrombotic syndrome is severe. In this study by Kahn et al., they looked at the result of quality of life scores one month and four months after patients had an acute DVT treated with anticoagulation. 
and at one month, the patients had a quality of life on par with chronic lung disease and arthritis, and similar to patients with coronary angina. At four months, the DVT patients had a quality of life on par with chronic lung disease, so COPD, emphysema, and then chronic arthritis. When Dr. Kahn looked at the quality of life at two years in these patients who had an acute DVT, the quality of life was on par again with chronic arthritis, chronic lung disease, deafness, and chronic diabetes. And the most severe form of post-thrombotic syndrome had quality of life scores on par with chronic coronary angina, cancer, and congestive heart failure. So post-thrombotic syndrome is often a undetected or ignored clinical problem, even when it, the patient is suffering from it, and the consequences of suffering from it can be severe for the individual patient. Now, post-thrombotic syndrome, as I mentioned, takes a toll on the patient. And, and many of these patients are an untold story. They get lost in the healthcare system. The patients have a need for improvement but oftentimes have a hard time finding a path forward. So this was a 45 year old female teacher that I had the pleasure of taking care of. She was a school teacher in Pennsylvania. As a child, she had had scoliosis surgery and now as an adult had recurrent lumbar spine surgery for symptomatic degenerative disc disease. Following her surgery, she developed an extensive left leg iliofemoral vein DVT she was treated with anticoagulation and because of her spine surgery was not treated with thrombolysis. The patient recovered fine from her spine surgery, but she had chronic left leg heaviness and swelling, and she was unable to stand for prolonged periods of time due to her chronic venous insufficiency and hypertension. Consequently, she was unable to work as a teacher due to her leg symptoms and she was the sole provider for her family and desperate for a solution. This is her leg three months after. You see the swelling and discoloration that she was still experiencing on the right side of the panel here. So the patient went to three different vascular specialists to say, what can I do about my left leg? And what she was told was she could wear a compression stocking she could elevate her leg, she could retire and go on disability. But nobody gave her a path forward for actually curing her problem. She came to see us uh, desperate for improvement. And so as an outpatient, we brought her to the lab, uh, performed a venogram under local anesthesia with sedation. Uh, she had a outflow tract obstruction in the iliac vein with scar and occlusive disease. Uh, we ended up treating her with an angioplasty and stent, used IVIS to, si to size that angioplasty and stent. And in post-op, she had complete resolution of the swelling and heaviness. She returned to work and she got her leg and her life back. These are the films of her venogram. You can see on the left, collaterals with near occlusion at the common femoral vein and the pelvic brim. We cross this lesion to the IVC. You can see that the common iliac vein is small and diseased. We went ahead and angioplasty the entire length of the lesions and then built up stents from the common femoral through the external iliac and up to the IVC. And this is her completion study. So patients with acute DVT are common and the post-thrombotic syndrome occurs in up to 75% of patients after a DVT treated with anticoagulation alone. Post-thrombotic syndrome symptoms can be mild such as swelling or severe with skin damage, pain and ulceration. Treatment of chronic scar and obstruction with angioplasty and stent can resolve symptoms Treatment with angioplasty stent also is associated with good long-term durability. So uh, in light of the discussion on post-thrombotic syndrome and the patient's experience, um, I wanted to ask the panel, uh, what do you do when you're confronted with the situation? Because there's kind of two pictures. It's binary, not always binary, but, but oftentimes you may have a patient who has had a DVT, has post-thrombotic scar, 
but their symptoms are kind of on the milder side. They may have some swelling, they may have some heaviness, they don't have skin damage, um, and they don't have an ulcer, but you look on your ultrasound and you see that the iliac and common femoral veins are scarred. Then you have the other patient who has the same anatomy with scar in the iliac and femoral veins, and then they've got you know severe symptoms, the typical symptoms of skin damage, uh, maybe claudication. Do you treat both groups of patients the same? And should we be treating younger patients who have outflow obstruction and milder symptoms early rather than wait until they develop the more severe symptoms? Who wants to take that? So I would say, you know, I mean, we always should treat the uh, patient and their symptoms and not specifically the imaging. And what I think is probably the difference between the two, if you, you looked at them um, in some fashion, is that compensation is different, meaning that one group has developed better collaterals than the other and may not have symptoms. And certainly I have seen patients even with an occluded outflow, common iliac, that the amount of symptoms that they see is remarkably small. So I think that we don't have any data, like if you had both of these groups of people were two years out, whether the group that is mildly affected, are they doomed to get an ulcer in the future? Probably the answer is no. So I think that we do need to be symptom driven. And what I focus on really is how much this is impacting the patient's activities of daily living and quality of life. At the same time, we don't want to be dismissive of symptoms that may not be as visible to the naked eye, and that may be also why some patients don't get referred early enough with symptoms of venous claudication. So sometimes you'll have patients that uh, visually their leg doesn't look that big, they don't have that much edema, yet they can't exercise. So an example of that is I had a gentleman that was a Coast Guardsman, had some varicose veins. Uh, went and had those treated, got no better, but he couldn't pass his PT test anymore because he couldn't run very well because his leg would get too heavy. So um, we really need to kind of look at how old is the patient? What is it that they need to be doing? What is their job? What is their quality of life? And really tailor things to the patient rather than just to the imaging. I think um, to add to what Kathy's saying, I think sometimes these patients may not be symptomatic at the onset when you discover them, when you discover them with their chronic obstruction, maybe three months after their initial DVT, but they may develop more skin changes or more symptoms or recurrent DVTs over time. And as vascular physicians, I think it's important that we continue to monitor these patients and follow them and see when they cross that threshold, when that affects their quality of life, affects their ability to do their normal behaviors, or starts to create an impact on their uh, physical appearance or their leg or their, their function in a way that you need to go forward and be aggressive. Erin? Yeah, so I would add, I, I definitely agree that we're symptom driven and very focused on the individual patient and weighing the pros and cons to make that decision. Um, but I would, the only thing to add to the, to the discussion is to make sure we're mitigating their future risk of, post of, of developing recurrent DVT. So we, you know, we do have occasional patients, like Kathy said, that show up with an occluded IVC or an occluded iliac, and they're pretty symptom-free, and they don't really want to do anything. But it's important to protect their collaterals and to um, keep those patients on a blood thinner and monitor them. Um, I see too often they, those type of patients that the symptoms go away or symptoms get pretty mild. And then they say, okay, you've completed your three months or your six months of anticoagulation. They pull them off their blood thinner. And then a few months later, they're back in with another DVT. So just making sure we recognize those patients, even if we're not going to surgically intervene and treat them medically. For patients who have C4, 5, 6 disease, uh, symptomatic legs, how often do you find, you know, when you do your imaging, say you do a venogram, you don't see a classic uh, occluded uh, vein, uh, maybe there's not much in the way of collaterals. Then you put the IVUS catheter up and you find the kind of webbing and uh, scar that I showed uh, in the slide. How often do you think that is part of the story in these patients? And do you treat that differently than you do a compression lesion? Or do you treat it differently than you do a more uh, expansive post thrombotic patient with uh, dense scar? I think that the, the, the pictures that you showed that um, 
compared the size of the artery and the vein were important because I think that somebody might like that one that you had of the external iliac that didn't look so awful. But when you compare it to the artery, you realize, okay, in terms of physics, a scarred vein that size is not going to have good outthrow from the leg. And that person may not have an ulcer, but that might be someone that has exercise limitations. So I think putting the whole picture together is really important. And, um, you know, imaging patients, all the, you know, their entire leg. So there are some times where you'll have a patient that you're going to convince that you're going to find an outflow obstruction, but their popliteal veins occluded, which is, a, I think, a bad scenario. You know, right. that's a, a scenario where we really need better intervention and their outflow is fine. You know, those people can be very affected. So really kind of looking at the whole picture of the entire leg after they've had a DVT, um, I think Aaron's point of um, that these patients need ongoing evaluation and care is important. Unless they've had like a minor caffeine DVT after a knee scope, I tell patients, you have a condition that you need to be followed for really lifelong, kind of like diabetes or hypertension or something else, that you've had a DVT and you need to be monitored and followed. Ron? Yeah, I would agree. I think when you're talking about the C4 to C6 patients, it's important that we do a complete evaluation of the entire leg as well as the iliac vasculature all the way up through the IVC because a, a, a large percentage of those patients may have some form of iliac obstruction or chronic post-thrombotic change somewhere in their fempop or iliofemoral segment. And doing IVIS is going to be important to identify some of those minor changes and measuring circumferential areas as well to see how they quantify versus the norm, how they escalate from the common femoral centrally and make sure that you have normal increase in size as you're pro progressing centrally. Um, and if you don't, and somebody has the higher end of venous disease and they have ulceration, I'm going to be more aggressive in that patient population, even if I see minor changes and minor webbing in those veins. Aaron? Yeah, so I, I'd say that the most common scenario that I see this come into play is in patients who have um, some sort of obstructive lesion, like a Maytherner type anatomy and a history of DVT, and because of the high pressures, their vein is scarred. So you see a combination of really long segment stenosis below lesions. Where the danger lies in these patients is a novice stenter will stent just the lesion that's apparent, just the webbing or just the Maytherner, and they'll leave behind the really um, scarred, non-compliant, um, narrow vein below it because it's patent and looks okay. It's circular on, you know, venogram and ibis, um, but the area is markedly reduced. So that will drastically affect your outcome for your patient, both his symptom relief as well as patency for the stent long term. So I, I would caution to always be looking at the areas to be somewhat normal uh, physiologically and to strive for that. Um, I think a diffusely narrow vein should be treated in a similar fashion. All right. Well, I think what we should do at this point is uh, Dr. Gibson has an excellent presentation for us. And so perhaps uh, we should move on to that. Hi, my name is Kathleen Gibson. And I don't get the fun talk talking about stents and things like that. What I'm going to talk to you about is medical management of post-thrombotic syndrome, which is, I think, very important to recognize what options we have for treating our patients medically that have this problem. So some of this is repetition from what you heard from Dr. Gagne, but the incidence of post-thrombotic syndrome after DVT is substantial. And we know that those patients that develop post-thrombotic syndrome, up to 10% of them will have a venous ulcer within one to two years after their DVT. Some of the factors that increase the risk of post-thrombotic syndrome include a second episode of DVT. So it's very important after patients have a DVT and they've had their initial treatment to reassess and see, does this person deserve or need prolonged anticoagulation at lower dose to help prevent a second event? more proximal DVT or iliofemoral DVT, the presence of obesity, and the presence of a combination of deep venous reflux and obstruction. The spectrum of post-thrombotic syndrome can range from fairly mild edema and pain all the way to debilitating wounds, and can also in between include venous claudication and skin changes. The economic impact of venous leg ulcers on our society is substantial. 
Medical treatment plus time off work costs over a billion dollars a year in the United States. And looking at Medicare data, just at Medicare patients, not private pay, the median cost in a Medicare patient to treat a venous leg ulcer till the time it heals is about $16,000 per patient. The average incidence, if you look at Medicare claims of those claims that are for venous leg ulcers is 2.2% and a half a percent in private insurance patients. Some principles of medical management. First off, the great thing would be is if we could prevent post-thrombotic syndrome from occurring after a patient has a DVT. However, uh, we know that after a DVT, particularly a proximal DVT, if the patients are appropriately anticoagulated, this reduces the risk of post-thrombotic syndrome up to 78%. Some of the studies that this come from were before we had the DOACs, the direct oral anticoagulants, and they found that the time and therapeutic range for patients on warfarin had a correlation to whether or not they developed post-thrombotic syndrome. We have the opportunity with the direct oral anticoagulants to have better patient compliance. And hopefully with the advent of these drugs, we will have less post-thrombotic syndrome. This remains to be seen. Compression therapy is uh, controversial since the SOX trial came out, but many of us do believe that if you counsel your patients correctly and they are compliant with compression, that this may help. Proper wound care for those patients that have wound care is important. There's some pharmacologics that I will talk about. And key for any patient with DVT is trying to uh, have exercise, weight management, and focus on improving calf muscle pump function. Some wound care concepts for patients with uh, wounds and post-thrombotic syndrome are controlling edema, decreasing bio-burden in a wound, exudate control, controlling any active infection, uh, the use potentially of adjuvant therapies to speed healing, and then there's some pharmacotherapy I'm going to talk to you about. So edema control, uh, there is good data that patients with ulcers uh, have faster healing rates when they have compression compared to no compression, and that multi-component systems are more effective. More patients heal with a, a high compression stocking than with a short stress bandage. One thing that we do need to be aware of in patients with DVT, post-thrombotic syndrome, and ulcers is also not to forget the arterial system to assess patients for um, impaired uh, blood flow. And if an ABI is less than 0.5 or absolute ankle pressure is less than 60, care must be taken when using compression in, in wound care. So the evidence quality for what kind of compression should be used is mixed. And I would say that we really shouldn't be too dogmatic about what kind of compression we're using. We need to do what our patients will tolerate. So types of compression include short stretch bandages, long stretch bandages, una boots, multi-layer compression wraps, pneumatic compression, and then compression stockings, which get used more often once an ulcer is healed or once there's not too much exudate. Otherwise, the stockings can become very um, saturated with exudate. Debridement's important. Active debridement has a positive impact on wound healing. The debridement may be sur surgical or uh, kind of a mechanical debridement in the office. Guidelines do recommend against ultrasonic debridement. There's all kinds of different products and autolytic agents, enzymatic agents that can be used that are beyond the scope of this talk. But at every visit, when a patient's having wound care for post-thrombotic syndrome, thoroughly cleaning their leg is important and reducing that bio burden of a biofilm. Sometimes these debridements can be painful and local uh, topical or injection anesthesia is often necessary. And if the wound is bad enough, the first debridement in particular may need to be done under anesthesia in the hospital. There are lots of different ways to control exudate, ranging from using alginates to hydrocolloids, uh, film and foam dressings, and it's important to protect the para-ulcer skin and consider a topical steroid if they develop dermatitis. So, so routinely putting people with post-thrombotic syndrome and ulcers on systemic antibiotics is discouraged. Patients should not be routinely cultured unless there's evidence that they are clinically infected, and um, really only with clinical infection or systemic symptoms should they uh, have antibiotics. When do you need to treat infection? Again, if they're systemically ill, if they have cellulitis, you do need to treat them. And with cellulitis, make sure that you have good gram-positive coverage. If the patient has diabetes, you also have to consider broader spectrum coverage. 
And if the patient's medically complex, certainly consider getting an infectious disease consultation. And if they're clinically ill, they often will need to be admitted for um, IV antibiotics. So adjuvant therapies in our practice, uh, if we've done all of the things we need to do in terms of treating superficial and deep venous disease, if they've been stented, they've had their varicose veins treated, and we're treating an ulcer, and we've done everything that we can as surgeons, then if we don't see progress in the wound healing after four to six weeks, we go to an adjuvant therapy. So there's several that can be considered, including growth factors, non-living dermal substitutes, and some bioengineered dermal equivalents. And last um, option would be a skin graft. So this is an example of a patient that got a skin graft. This should not be primary therapy. We consider it for large wounds and those that have stalled after other um, standard therapies. So pharmacotherapy, these are uh, some classes where there's data that shows that there may be benefit to patients. So pentoxifylline, horse chestnut extract, uh, flavonoids, and statins, which I think are very intriguing. And I don't have another slide on statins, but there's some data which suggests that pain from post-thrombotic syndrome and some other issues can be improved with statins. And there's a randomized trial run by uh, Susan Kahn's group that's going to be enrolling soon that should help with this. And one reason I find this intriguing is um, we know kind of all these other benefits we're seeing from statins in terms of DVT prevention and in the arterial system. Also, these are very widely used drugs. They're not expensive anymore and we are very familiar with their side effects. So I think that it's pretty exciting that they may have a, a role as well. So in terms of pentoxifylline, uh, I'm going to focus here on the uh, Cochrane Review, it supports the use of pentoxifylline and the use of compression stockings for uh, complete ulcer healing or significant ulcer improvement. And this is something that I do use in my practice. However, look, if you look at the study by Falonga, the 800 milligrams TID, that's a large dose of pentoxifylline. And a lot of patients will not tolerate that dose due to GI and headache complaints. Uh, but it is something that we do in our practice, although oftentimes patients have to end up at 400 milligrams three times a day and cannot tolerate that higher dose. Horse chestnut extract, um, there's mixed data on this. And the, the data from the Cochrane Review shows decrease in pain primarily in patients with post-thrombotic syndrome and horse chestnut extract. This is not something that I use in my practice, so I'm not quite as familiar with using this uh, medication. Flavonoids, uh, these uh, have some really compelling data in Europe. Uh, there's been 14 con randomized controlled data and uh, all but one study showed a benefit to flavonoids. So in Europe, this is marketed as Daflon, um, uh, diasmine hesperin, and uh, in the United States, vascularia. And um, one of the problems with these are that some patients cannot tolerate them from a GI perspective. And at least in the United States, these are not inexpensive. There's no evidence to recommend, or there's mixed data on aspirin, allopurinol, steroids, zinc, and solastazole. Finally, let's talk about lifestyle interventions. And even these interventions, if there's mixed data, these are the kind of things, well, it never hurts to tell someone to exercise. So even if the data is mixed, this is a good idea. I talk to my patients about really doing walking and things to stretch out their calf muscle pump. I have some that do Achilles stretches. And it does appear that there's data that this improves venous specific quality of life. Uh, if a patient has post-thrombotic syndrome, when they're home watching TV, reading, et cetera, I advise them to elevate their legs. Weight management, again, this is like exercise. This is a no brainer. Unless you're underweight, weight loss almost helps everything. And uh, this decreases central venous pressure. And I think it can have an impact on how patients' legs feel. And then finally, uh, with patients with damaged skin, making sure that they have a good moisturizer that they're using at least twice a day, because if they have cracked and dried skin, this is a, a area where they can get cellulitis and wounds. So in conclusions, post-thrombotic syndrome is common after DVT, and I would say the best prevention is up front, having a good intervention um, and having good anticoagulation and appropriate anticoagulation may be a long-term thing for these patients. Before they have an ulcer, it would be good to work with them on exercise, lifestyle modification, and may or may not put them on pharmacologics.
when they get to the point that they do have an ulcer, besides the things that we're going to talk about with stenting and superficial vein treatment, is um, compression, debridement, controlling bio burden, and considering adjuvant therapy when things stall out. So that is all I have to say about medical management. All right, Kathleen, that was great. Uh, that was very comprehensive and informative. Um, I'd like to open up to the panel uh, for questions. Um, let me, if I could, start off. Uh, when do you uh, add biopsies to your ulcer patients? And what are the conditions that would lead you to biopsy uh, in the management of that form of post-thrombotic syndrome? So I think that that's a really important question, and I have a whole other talk on when veins or when wounds look weird. Uh, so, you know, I think that if you do this long enough, you know kind of what a venous ulcer looks and feels like. So if somebody comes to me with like a fungating wound that doesn't hurt, you know, that's a cancer, uh, most likely. So if it doesn't, if the history doesn't sound right, if it doesn't look right, if it's not painful, then I would be more likely to get a biopsy. Um, we in our practice do not do very many biopsies for um, infection wound counts. We don't tend to do that too often. There are places that do, but um, you know, we don't do a lot of biopsies unless we are concerned about the wound. The other one where you might do one is if you've done all the right things in terms of um, what you can do to, for wound healing and the wound stalls out and maybe before you do adjuvant therapies, which can be quite expensive, you may want to confirm um, that it is a venous wound and that you're not dealing with something medical. Um, I also make good use of our some of our more um, medically advanced dermatologists that are really good at cluing in on odd wounds. But again, if you've been doing this a long time and sometimes you'll look and say, this just does not look right for a venous wound. It's in the wrong spot. The patient doesn't have enough pain. There's no history that's consistent. Then I will get one. Ron, um, what is your um, pattern of anticoagulation use? Kathleen pointed out how important it is to uh, decrease post traumatic syndrome after uh, DVT by using uh, adequate anticoagulation and the data obviously focused more early on, on on warfarin and INR levels, but there are differences in the anticoagulants that are available to us now. Uh, what do you think are, are some important thoughts about which anticoagulation to use? And do you use one forever or do you stage it with an injectable like Lovenox and then go to an oral? What's, what's your plan? Well, I think it depends what we're talking about. If we're talking about the acute DVT phase or the post-intervention phase, and I guess we'll get into the post-intervention phase a little later on. But in the acute DVT process, I think whatever is going to be tolerated by the patient, used consistently, is most important. We, we want these patients to get adequate anticoagulation. And I think for me as an interventional radiologist, I think partnering with good colleagues within the institution, vascular medicine at my current institution, hematology at my former institution, who can really help manage and target the appropriate anticoagulant for each of these patients. I don't think we can be on an island and manage all these patients on our own. Um, DOACs have really changed the game for us and been able to get people therapeutic anticoagulation in an easy way that's tolerated by patients well um, without lots of hospital visits and challenging monitoring. So I think it's, it's changed it dramatically on what we're able to do from an anticoagulation standpoint. I like to choose Eliquis over Xarelto in the acute DVT patients because of the bioavailability and twice daily dosing that has a more consistent anticoagulant effect. Aaron, anything further to add? No, I agree with Ron. We uh, tailor it to the patient and the current clinical situation. There's a couple clotting disorders that I tend to prefer you know, Coumadin, I tend to prefer Lovenox early because it's anti-inflammatory. It's the best we got, but nobody's going to tolerate that if they don't have to for more than a few weeks. So I generally do that the first couple weeks early on after DVT and then switch them to whatever is appropriate for that patient. All right. Well, I think uh, that was an excellent discussion. I appreciate your insights. I think at this point, uh, we'll move on to uh, Dr. Murphy uh, has an excellent discussion for us on uh, what we should be thinking about regarding uh, venous stenting. Thank you, Paul. I'm going to talk about the role of venous stents in treating post-thrombotic patients um, when our uh, medical methods are not enough. 
What's important to know is that most patients can be treated, and this is still a message that we're trying to get out um, into the medical community. We've made big progress in the last 10 years, but we have more to go. Um, all these patients at the bottom of the screen had significant uh, degrees of venous obstruction and huge quality of life issues. Um, and, and they all improved significantly, uh, went on to pretty asymptomatic states after proper surgical treatment. The important thing is to be able to get these patients to us, to be able to assess the patients for candidacy for an operation. And then when we're doing the operations, to pay a lot of attention to technique in detail. When I'm talking about candidacy, again, most patients do have an option um, generally three to six months after the initial DVT event, we look for patients that are candidates for postoperative anticoagulation. The majority of patients with post thrombotic disease have inflow disease, some have clotting disorders, they may have recurrent events. So a good proportion of these patients do require some degree of long-term anticoagulation that will improve their stent patency. So it's important that the patients are going to be compliant with follow-up. As we talked about earlier tonight, this is a lifelong disease process, and these patients really need to be treated like they have a chronic condition and the stents need to be followed, as do the patients clinically. I tend to avoid treating patients um, electively who are morbidly obese, BMIs 40, 45 or greater. They're less active. There's less flow through the stents. You can't follow the stents as well. They're not a, a very compliant group. Um, but of course, in a uh, extreme circumstance, I do treat those patients. Um, paying attention to inflow for candidacy, what you're really looking for is that you have enough blood flow to support a stent. It's really not appropriate um, to take these stents past the profunda vein or into the femoral. So as caudal as you're going to get is that profunda femoral confluence. Seeing inflow like this on your preoperative ultrasound is very reassuring that your patient is gonna have a good result. Um, often in post-thrombotic patients, you don't see both a widely patent profunda and femoral like this, um, but you do often see circumstances like here where the profunda has gotten quite big to compensate for a fairly diseased femoral vein. Um, and this is often very adequate for good long-term results. When you start seeing patients who have both diseased femoral and profunda inflow, you really want to limit this to um, to intervening if you're very comfortable with this patient group and you're really going to be able to maximize your inflow, landing your stent precisely where you need it, making sure you're pinning flaps up in the correct direction, ballooning your inflow. This is a riskier group. And patients with no inflow, no patent profunda, no patent femoral vein, I often don't offer um, these procedures first line. Um, I prefer to give them maximal medical treatment and leave them options for the future. If you put a stent in these patients and they occlude, they're very difficult um, to deal with or to get any improvement thereafter. Uh, you wanna pay attention on your preoperative ultrasound to where you're gonna land your stent. It gives you an idea for planning your case as in this patient who has a good femoral profunda, there's a good landing zone above, but then it quickly gets very diseased. So you know you're gonna have to be right on that confluence. So when you're looking at the steps of the surgery, the procedure itself can be broken down into very basic steps, access imaging, predilation, stenting, post-dilation, post-imaging. Um, it seems fairly simple for most vascular interventionalists, but the devil is in the details with venous cases. Venous stents most often occlude because people aren't paying attention to the details and they underestimate the difficulty of decision-making in venous cases. So what I'm gonna do is go through these steps and discuss some of the tips and tricks and small details that can be missed. When paying attention to um, access, the, most, the easiest place, the most consistent place to get access um, successfully in a post-thrombotic patient is the upper third of the femoral vein. Even if this vein is diseased or sometimes occluded, you often can get through with relative ease. You look for where it rolls lateral to the artery um, and you can frog like the patient to get a little bit better visualization of that um, location. Uh, the IJ and popliteal vein are rather difficult for chronic occlusions, particularly if you've got disease in the femoral vein and you also have longer running rooms. What your goal is, is to access low enough that your sheath is below the level of the lesser trochanter, which almost universally comes in 
somewhere along uh, the profunda, which comes somewhere in along the lesser trochanter. Um, if the sheath is below the lesser trochanter, you should be able to assess the entire common femoral vein. This prevents you from leasing, leaving disease in the common femoral vein above the profunda femoral confluence. This is a slide showing the consequence of a high access. This patient had ulcers, skin changes, edema, pain, um, went to the operating room, unfortunately, with common femoral access. They did a good job recanalizing the segment, um, re good job stenting. But unfortunately, as they pulled out, you can see while the stent is patent, um, just below the stent, right before they entered the sheet, there's still significant amount of disease present in that common femoral vein, but they couldn't stent any lower because their axis didn't go any lower. Um, this patient, unfortunately, had a stent occlusion that we've not been able to recanalize. And this was actually his preoperative ultrasound that I showed on the prior screen with a good landing zone right at the femoral profunda confluence. He would have been a um, likely success if the stent had been landed in the correct place and access achieved at the right place. So super important not to cheat in the venous system or take shortcuts. Um, once you're starting the case, I do get a venogram. I use this just for an overall picture of what my plan is going to be. Look at patency, collaterals, a roadmap of what's to come. But if there's any level of occlusion, the next step is to cross it. Uh, this can be accomplished usually with relative ease, transversing these trabeculated veins. Uh, don't be afraid to pull back quite a bit if you get into the wrong spot and kind of re-guide or redirect your wire in a different path. Uh, perforations are usually self-limiting and it does not mean that you need to abort the case, but it can sometimes be hard to redirect unless you pull your wire back far enough. Um, you get venograms to confirm your re-entry. You confirm re-entry multiple ways, um, including with the use of IVIS and including with free wire movement. You get pretty used to the wire movement you should have if you're in a wide open cava. What you want to avoid um, is entering the spinal canal via the venous plexus. You need to know how to recognize this. Uh, very dangerous move entering these are collaterals. Um, and it's most often when physicians don't get that lateral view, you can be mistaken on an AP. Um, this is what it looks like. This is not my case, but you can see this stent is actually in the cava. This wire is traveling midline on the spine. So this wire is not in the cava clearly, but even if the scent wasn't here, you should be able to recognize that a wire midline on the vertebral bodies is in the wrong place. Um, and this patient actually was stented into this um, and this is where the stent wound up. So what you should have on your imaging is a nice gentle curve laterally that goes anterior to the vertebral bodies. And you always wanna check a lateral to make sure on your recanalization cases. After crossing the occluded segments, the next step is intravascular ultrasound. I use this to determine the proximal and distal extent of the disease and the degree of stenosis. In many cases of non-thrombotic patients, you can compare to adjacent segments in the vein or to contralateral vein. I find in post-thrombotic patients, you're really shooting for an ideal anatomic normal. And so I tend to use these guideline numbers. So common femoral vein, external iliac vein, common iliac vein, roughly should be 12, 14, 16 millimeter uh, diameters, which equates to one areas 125, 150, and 200, which are the numbers that I use. The, these are just two examples of cases. So in this particular patient, the venogram looks pretty good, but we talked about a case like this before. The vein is actually diffusely narrow. So this is a common iliac vein. The area should be around 200. It was around 67, which is almost 70% stenosis. This is another patient who had several normal venograms. He was actually a stent restenosis. And despite several normal venograms and being told nothing was wrong, he should have an area in that stent of 200. The area in his stent was 50. That's a 75% stenosis. And after um, pretty aggressive dilation, his symptoms got much better. So please pay attention to the areas. Um, after you determine your degree of stenosis and that you're going to treat your patient, uh, you're going to identify the top and bottom of the stenting zone. So cranially, it's often the iliac confluence. You're looking for where the vein, as you move your ibis up and down, goes on and off the screen. You want to identify this 
um, point well. If your disease goes more cranial than this, you can go to the infrarenal cava, the suprarenal cava, or even into the intrathoracic cava. Um, we have stented as high as to the atrium and just at the hepatic veins, but you don't wanna go into the pericardium. Distally, you wanna be in the healthiest segment determined by IVUS, not venogram, because venogram can miss webbing and disease in the vein, and the healthiest segment above the profunda. One of the most common mistakes I see is leaving disease between the edge of the stent and the profunda. It's the number one reason for stent occlusion. Um, it is okay to cross the ligament um, and that, that goes for new stents and old stents. The number one reason for occlusion is disease left behind, not stents across the ligament. You wanna pre-dilate every, all the disease. Uh, this is the most important step to treating this and resolving this uh, fibrotic scarring in the vein. You actually need quite large non-compliant high pressure balloons. In the iliac veins, generally 14 to 18 millimeters, depending on the patient. In the IVC, up to 24 millimeters. You can balloon crush and stent across IVC filters. You wanna use large stents to match normal anatomy. And you wanna limit oversizing when you're using the night and all stents in particular. With the wall stents, we got pretty used to using um, larger sizes because those stents will kind of correct themselves. Uh, night and all always seeks to be the size that it's intended to be. So if you put in an 18 or a 20, that patient can have significant pain if it's not meant to be that big. Um, you want to make sure you're planning your overlap with these longer stents. You wanna make sure you go around all pelvic turns. This is more one of the more recent um, things that I'm seeing more of with the newer stents. It, these stents are a little bit stronger. They tend to straighten the vein. So in this particular patient, the, the stent didn't go around the turn. It was ended at the turn. It kind of straightened the segment out. And you can see, you can imagine in some of these patients, the stent is then eating straight through the vein or it's abutting the wall eventually and you're getting patients jailing the flow from below. And this patient from the AP venogram looked totally normal. You would have had to get a lateral view to see this and to make sure you're through the bend. You wanna use longer stents to get past that external iliac bend, even if you're only treating a Maytherner in these type of patients. Um, again, okay to cross the inguinal ligament. A couple of details with, with the different stent types. Wall stents, we've always been told to take them into the cava because the ends are weaker. They can, when placed under an arterial compression point that we do often see in these Maytherner or in these post thrombotic patients, they can be watermelon seated distally. They can also collapse or occlude at the top. But unfortunately, when we take them too high, they can cause contralateral DVT. And I have already treated this in patients with the newer night and elf stents as well. So any stent taken across a confluence can um, over time function like a covered stent as neo intima covers the interstices. Uh, we really don't wanna be jailing these um, on purpose. If you do cover the other side, you do wanna anticoagulate those patients long-term. Um, alternatively, with the wall stent, you can use a Z stent at top to buttress that, that end and make it stronger so you don't have to take it across and into the cava. Um, you can also land the newer night null stents either at the confluence or just into the confluence of the um, two iliac veins at the IVC without blocking the other side. These stents are stronger at the ends than the wall stent is. Uh, bilateral stenting can be accomplished again with the wall stent Z, Z stent technique. This one is an abre where they were deployed in kissing fashion right at the confluence to recreate that. Um, afterwards, you're gonna post dilate all these stents. This is very important step with nitinol. It actually changes the crystal structure of the nitinol and it will not be as strong of a stent unless it's post dilated to its nominal size. Um, you wanna always completion uh, IVUS, make sure you're not missing anything. Uh, final venogram to make sure you have good clearance. When we're looking at patency, we have pretty good results in the post thrombotic patients, regardless of stent type, all of the current trials are showing um, this 80%, 81% patency. It's a little bit higher um, in the Cook stent, but that included all chronic patients, including the uh, Maytherner group. It was just a chronic disease group. Um, out to 24 months, only Vici is reporting so far, slight reduction of patency, but 
um, probably they're all going to be around the same. Just looking at a couple quick cases, this is a patient who, you know, over 10 years had been treated for lymphedema in her one leg. Um, here's her venogram, kind of a diffuse post-thrombotic uh, type stenosis. And then her results afterwards, um, she was markedly better and wasn't even compliant with compression anymore and still had a uh, marked improvement in her quality of life and her exam. This is a patient, a 39-year-old male who is actually uh, nearing disability, who then uh, had been diagnosed with bilateral primary lymphedema. He, of course, had undergone bilateral greater saphenous vein ablations with no help. Um, and literally, while applying for disability, he got a DVT in his left leg uh, below what we found to be a chronic occlusion up to the level of hepatic veins that had never been diagnosed. Um, and afterwards, he's pretty much symptom-free. We just treated his varicose veins last year as his kind of only remaining symptom. So it, it kind of in conclusion, you really have happy patients. You really can change their life. This woman had an occluded cava for 20 years. She came in wearing heels. Uh, this guy had this ulcer um, who was uh, embarrassed, depressed. It was recurrent. He had leg pain all the time. And he came in with his leg looking like this and engaged. And um, it really does change a lot of things when patients aren't in pain all the time um, and struggling with how their legs feel. So in general, uh, post-thrombotic syndrome is treatable in most patients. Um, it can be uh, managed surgically, but currently I think is under managed surgically because we don't get the referrals for all of these patients. They don't all know we can do something for them. Um, percutaneous intervention is relatively straightforward as long as we pay attention to the details, low morbidity, zero expected mortality, reasonable patency is the rule, um, and patients really do quite better. And as Paul said earlier, the quality of life is dramatically decreased in these patients and it really can be improved. And all of the new stent trials are, are, are showing that data as well. The quality of life is really dramatically better. Thank you. Aaron, thank you. That was uh, truly excellent. Um, and uh, I do have a question for you though. So you, you mentioned about the, um, the various cross-sectional area target sizes. And, you know, the first question I have is, is how do you uh, adjudicate that in the setting of different patient ha uh, body habitus? You may have the six foot six, 250 pound uh, mountain man, and then you've got the five foot two uh, petite uh, woman. That's question number one. And number two is when you have a long segment occlusion, do you build up stents of different sizes now that we have these long night and all stents that can almost traverse from the common femoral vein to the caval confluence most of the time? Uh, do you use one size? Do you build up in a funnel fashion? How do you manage that? Sure. Uh, so second question first, um, I tend, you know, we don't, we don't know enough, frankly, about venous disease and the technology is advancing uh, almost faster than some of our knowledge is. Uh, we're still learning as we're developing. Um, as far as, you know, how to really reconstruct, I tend to prefer to mimic normal physiology as much as feasible. Um, so I, I, you know, you have valves up to the common femoral vein. And above that, in my mind, you're really counting on having kind of a siphon effect of smaller to larger, and that's what you see physiologically. So I tend to use um, stent sizes that match the segments. So a 14 up to a 16 or a 16 up to an 18 um, and continue that tapered fashion. I don't in all patients, but in most, um, I tend to use that. Whether or not that's better, um, there's no data on that at this point or whether that's necessary. Um, the other question, there's, uh, again, not, not much data behind it. Um, we've not validated those numbers. So I use them more as a guideline. Um, and over the years, I've found them pretty, pretty reliable as a guideline. So if I have a very petite, small woman, am I going to put 18s in? No. Um, but am I going to use still probably 14s to 16s? Yes. Um, and it holds up on most of your normal CT scans for those patients you do get um, scans on, their, their veins are pretty similar in size. Um, so for the men, you know, the six foot four with big, huge veins, athletes, 
um, yeah, you're probably going to use your bigger scent sizes, but I still don't think you need bigger than 18 in most cases. Kathleen, do you have a different uh, perspective or similar? No, it, it's pretty similar. I would say that my uh, stent sizes now that we have nitinol stents are smaller than what I used with wall stents. You know, with wall stents, it was mostly 16 and 18, and now I'm um, 14s and 16s, and an occasional 18. Um, so, you know, it's just that you, si you oversize slightly. You don't need to oversize quite as much they land so precisely that I think it's made things a lot easier for planning lengths. You're not, there's less surprises. So sometimes when you'd put a wall stent in, you'd be thinking, okay, I need to do this and that. And, and usually with wall stents to get from the confluence to just above the profunda took three stents and you'd have to figure out kind of how to lay those with um, the newer stents. Usually you can do it with two. Um, and so it, it's made it simpler. I've also done both ways. You said about, you know, starting little and then building up versus the other way. And on Ivis, I haven't seen a whole lot of difference with the nitinol um, open cells going one way or the other. It's the ballooning afterwards that is, ends up how they, how they look and they've looked good both ways. Whereas with wall stents, I think that they looked better um, on Ivis anyway, going small stent with the big stent flowering out of it. Um, but I think that's maybe cosmetic. I don't have any idea that that's better. Um, it's just which one looks prettier on Ivis. Ron, do you have any thoughts on uh, what Aaron was com commenting on about landing a stent in the curve in the pelvis and then getting that tapering of the vein? Uh, do you have any do's and don'ts? Uh, and do you think that makes a difference? I think my do's and don'ts match exactly what Aaron said. Um, learning and understanding before treating venous disease that there's an anatomic dip at the confluence of the external iliac vein and internal iliac vein. And if you're going to make the choice of putting a solitary stent, let's say in a common iliac vein for a non-thrombotic iliac vein lesion, not necessarily in PTS, make sure it's short enough that you're not abutting the base of that curve and that you're not crossing to the far wall and creating exactly what Aaron showed in that picture, that basically you're occluding the inflow from the external AF vein. And if there's any question in your mind that you're not able to land it in that precisely and that you're gonna cross across there, then take a longer stent. And now with these 100 centimeter, 150 centimeter stents that we have, um, we can, or 150 millimeter stents that we have, we can take them all the way down into the external iliac vein without too much worry. And, and do you taper your stents uh, as well? Or uh, what's your, uh, how do you use the IFU for sizing your stents? I do um, peripheral to central is my preference. I started that with wall stents, much like Kathy was saying. Um, I thought they sat better and you didn't have this offset between the smaller scent and the larger stent if you were stenting from central to peripheral. So I, I'd like to expand the smaller stent with the larger stent inside of it. Um, with some of the newer nitinol stents, especially the ones with the flared ends, uh, I still like to do that because I find peripherally the flared edge of that stent, I have started to see them perforate out of the external iliac vein or the common femoral vein. Um, so I like to keep that constrained within the other stent peripherally, if that makes sense. Yeah. I want to ask uh, for the panel, so when you get a uh, complicated uh, long segment iliac uh, IVC post thrombotic patient, we now have, you know, nitinol stents with uh, delivery systems that place those stents right where you want them to uh, with high reliability, you have larger diameters that are now available. Uh, um, Aaron showed us uh, a configuration with uh, the, the composite of Z stents and wall stents. How are you dealing with the confluence uh, when you have bilateral iliac and IVC disease? Are you double barreling? Are you putting one large stent in the IVC and then building into it? Uh, Kathy, do you want to take the first shot at that? Yes. Yeah, so uh, since the nitinol stents have been out. I haven't had anybody that had an IVC lesion that was small. The IVC cava was small enough that I didn't use a wall stent. I've used a wall stent and I've double barreled into them with nitinol stents. Um, 
you know, I think there could be circumstances where you could use one of the larger sizes of the night and all in the cava, but I haven't had a patient like that yet. Um, so I've been just double barreling into a wall stent, but I haven't been using with the night and all stents. I haven't used a Z stent. Aaron. Yeah. So I've been doing, I, I think I showed one image where I did kind of kissing stents to the confluence. Um, and then if I have a cava component, I do the cable stenting from the neck and kind of stent right, right to it and kind of nestle it in there. And it works pretty nicely. Um, I think short double barrels with the night and all stents are also fine. Um, I don't tend to do uh, or encourage long double barrels in the cava. I think eventually they become two tubes and you're basically making two smaller tubes instead of one bigger, which we know is hemodynamically not as good. Ron, any tips for us? Um, I'll, I'll contradict Aaron just a little bit. And I tend to put in a 20 millimeter uh, night null stent in the IBC and then do double barrel kissing stents into there. Um, I, I'm relying and maybe foolishly on the open cell design that we're going to get crossing flow across those interstices over time. And it's going to remain open as opposed to a solitary stent that's crossing the contralateral limb or contralateral iliac. You're having mixing in all the time. Um, so I think those interstices are going to stay open longer and they won't be two barrels. And so I've had pretty good success over the years. Um, I used to always use wall stents and kiss them up in a similar fashion um, with similar success rates. So Ron, how high are you taking your double barrels? Yeah. I imagine you're just taking them into the distal cava, right? I'm just taking them into the distal cava. Yeah. And, I, and I think what you said is important. I think both you and Kathy said it, if you're going to do that technique, stenting the IVC first and double barreling into it takes away some of that side loading forces on those stents. And those patients tend to do better than if you just double barrel into a cava. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, panel, thank you for that uh, excellent uh, discussion and those brilliant insights. Uh, finally, uh, I think we have an excellent talk uh, on the post procedural management uh, of the post thrombotic patient. And uh, Dr. Winokur. Uh, is going to come to us from the city of brotherly love and fill us in on what we need to do. Ron? All right. Thanks so much, Paul. Um, I'm excited to talk to you guys about post-procedural care. Not a lot of data to support this, um, but hopefully we'll run through the data a little bit to give an idea of what best practices can be. So before we start, I'm gonna go through a case presentation, I think to set the stage uh, as far as what we're talking about. So this is a 44 year old female, history of GI bleeding in 2016, as well as a right lower extremity DVT and PE, as well as right atrial thrombus. At the time, uh, because of the GI bleeding, she had an IVC filter put in and then returned as part of our IVC filter clinic follow-up three years later with worsening lower extremity pain and swelling exacerbated by pro prolonged standing. Uh, her Velalta scores in her legs were moderate, uh, seven on each side, and a VCSS of three on each side. And I know this CT scan is running through fairly quickly, but as was mentioned in some of the prior uh, presentations, you can see the small caliber of the external iliac veins here on both sides. So you can see the small caliber of those veins and you can see the small IVC at the level of the IVC filter as well. So clearly chronic post thrombotic changes throughout the iliocable system uh, related to that filter placement. So after workup and ultrasound and discussion, uh, we decided to bring her for intervention. Here's access as you were discussing in the prior slide, access into the mid femoral vein with the edge of the sheath here at the level of the lesser trochanter to evaluate the proper inflow from the common femoral vein. And you can see this really small caliber external iliac vein here with large collaterals uh, around that area on the left, uh, on the right side. The left side here uh, looks a little bit more patent, still small caliber external and common iliac veins with collaterals, but flow's getting through. And as you look centrally, you can still see chronic post thrombotic changes here, although there's flow passing through the IVC filter. So we moved forward on this patient, got through those chronic occlusions, uh, removed this uh, Denali filter here with a snare and using a sheet to remove the filter rather than stenting across and reconstructed this patient with iliocable stents. So IVC stent uh, 
uh, kissing common iliac stents, extending all the way down to the common femoral veins, creating adequate flow through that area. And here's her Velalta post-procedure. So pre, she was a seven on both legs. You can see immediate improvement in Velalta scores that persisted for a year after intervention. And here's her follow-up. Uh, during her follow-up, I perform ultrasounds on all these patients. And so I can assess for patency of these iliac veins and of these stents. And here you can see some sample images. Here's the left common iliac, internal iliac, and external iliac stented segments with adequate central flow. And here's a little further out, the external iliac vein shown beautiful flow centrally. So when you're thinking about post-procedure management of these patients, there's really three components to the post-procedure. Uh, that you're gonna look at. The first is clinical management. And clinical management is making sure that you assess these patients after their procedure, you see them in close follow-up, you bring them into clinic and monitor them closely so that you can assess for changes uh, over time quickly. And then at each of those clinical visits, it's important to do some sort of imaging. My preference is to follow all these patients with ultrasound imaging. It's something that's accessible with a registered vascular technologist and an ultrasound tech in my office, so I can get ultrasound images at each follow-up visit. And I usually do a follow-up two weeks post-treatment, one month, three months, six months, 12 months, and then follow them annually after that. And I like to do ultrasound imaging at each of those visits to assess what's going on with my stents. As far as anticoagulation, this is the most challenging component of post-procedure management when you're talking about these iliocable and iliofemoral reconstructions. And the reason is we don't have great data to support what we're doing and we don't have a lot besides our own clinical expertise and experience. And this is highlighted in two um, non-scientific publications that were put out there. Here's one from 2017 saying that there's no evidence that suggests that one anticoagulation is superior in preventing post-procedure instant thrombosis and anticoagulation choice is therefore largely personal. And then just this year in January, 2020, again, saying similar anticoagulation guidelines are not very helpful as they don't stipulate the anticoagulation treatment prescription after a venous stent placement. So we don't really have a good recommendation as to what the optimal anticoagulation is for these patients post-intervention. And then if we go into the scientific literature and we look at this uh, article by Mahmoud Rizavi, and we look at the effectiveness of stent placement for iliofemoral outflow obstruction, um, these patients were treated after the procedure with low molecular weight heparin um, until discharge, and then were treated on Coumadin um, for two to six months with a target INR of two to three. And in patients at high risk for thrombosis, anticoagulation regimens were extended longer than that six month timeline and lifelong anticoagulation medication uh, was routinely prescribed, but they didn't specify at what time point, what antiplatelet agent were they utilizing? Was this aspirin, was this Plavix? How were they giving the Plavix and were they loading the patient with Plavix up front? So let's look at some more data that we have. Here's a publication that is a uh, systematic review of articles published before December 15th of 2017. They went back and reviewed 396 articles. And of those 396 articles, they were able to pull out five eligible articles for their analysis. And so this covered a grand total of 61 patients that were included. And you can see that the anticoagulation choice in all of these studies predominantly was warfarin. Um, so these studies are relatively recent, and uh, although we are predominantly using warfarin uh, in all of these studies, and they had similar INR goals as we would expect, and they had pretty low rates of occlusion. Um, but as you've, pro as you've heard already, warfarin is not usually our first choice anticoagulant in a lot of these patients. And what if we look at patency rates in this patient population? So seven out of 55 almost 13% had stent occlusion. And if you look at the numbers and the patency rates based on the anticoagulation regimen that was chosen, was it anticoagulation alone, anticoagulation plus antiplatelets for more than six months or just greater than six months of anticoagulation, there's really not a major difference at 12 month patency in any of these patient populations. Now they had no statistical analysis to compare these groups. So I have no idea of the p-values here to tell you that one should be better than the other and 89% is better than 78% statistically, but those numbers definitely seem higher, at least 89% seems better. 
Let's look at another study. So here's an evaluation of anticoagulants and antiplatelet agents. This is a mixed group of patients. So these are all the iliocable stent patients that were treated between 2013 and 2017 at Yale. And to note that these are all patients treated with wall stents uh, and treated by 17 different operators. Um, and so here they detailed out for the May Therner group, the non-thrombotic iliac vein lesions, post-thrombotic patients and the acute DVT patients, what anticoagulations and anticoagulants and antiplatelet um, medications were given for each of those patients. And you can see a variety of different choices that were uh, used for everyone. And it spans a pretty large grouping. And you can see a large percentage, just like we saw before, received Coumadin, a similar percent received direct oral anticoagulants, um, and then a smaller percentage received low molecular weight heparin or low molecular weight heparin followed by a DOAC or oral anticoagulant of some sort, and then even smaller populations that received antiplatelet agents. And the patency rates, they only lumped it into all of them as one large group here. Um, and you can see these patency rates are what we would expect for each of these patient populations as far as patency rates at the, at the time point that they selected. As far as significant predictors of who's going to stay patent, and I wanted to see from their data, did they pick out and say, oh, the patients that had this particular type of anticoagulant choice that were treated with Coumadin versus Lovenox versus uh, anticoagulation plus antiplatelets, was there a difference in patency rates? They didn't actually go into that detail um, and give us that type of data. They just told us that the extent of stenting is really the statistically significant factor. So as you heard earlier, making sure that you stent into patent vein and have good inflow and good outflow is what's gonna predominantly give you the most information that you need as far as stent patency and predicting outcomes. The other piece of information that is important that goes along the same lines was the ones that did not have extension into the common femoral vein had a higher instance of having occlusion and restenosis, which goes down the same uh, logical thinking. And then lastly, here's a, an interesting publication. This was 106 experts in venous disease were uh, surveyed as far as their anticoagulant choice in patients with post-thrombotic syndrome. This spanned 78 different centers, 28 different countries, although predominantly they were from the uh, UK and Europe. And here you can see that it was a pretty large spread of choice as far as anticoagulations that were used that matched the other two studies that you saw. And so a mixture of patients getting Coumadin, low molecular weight followed by Coumadin, um, DOAX for life, and then a smaller grouping here that had antiplatelets plus low molecular weight heparin and then conversion to uh, direct oral anticoagulant or some of these other combinations. And then they looked at um, percentages. So low molecular weight heparin in the, in the initial uh, time point after stenting was, the, was a very popular choice of therapy. And I think uh, that's my personal choice of therapy that I choose for the initial four weeks after uh, stenting and reconstruction. And you can see 67% of the, of the individuals that were surveyed during this particular study agreed with that. And then lifelong anticoagulation after stents or recurrent DVT is done in 85% and then added value of antiplatelets in 40%. So there's a lot of variability in the choice of anticoagulants post reconstruction and stenting. So I wanted to bring up the C-TRAC trial to see, does the C-TRAC trial give us some guidance as to what we should be doing and how has the trial been designed as far as anticoagulation? And here's what we get from the C-TRAC um, protocol is anticoagulation for a minimum of six months. They do encourage the use of low molecular weight heparins in the initial three months post stenting and encourage the use of 81 milligrams of aspirin. They don't mention anywhere in the protocol, the use of clopidogrel or Plavix. Um, so not a lot of guidance as far as what to do with antiplatelet agents following intervention. So in summary, what is my approach to these patients? I like to differentiate these patients into low risk, moderate risk, and high risk groups. Similar to what you heard as far as who should you choose for intervention, there's gonna be the low risk that have great inflow from the femoral and profundofemoral, and then moderate risk that may have minimal inflow or a, uh, 
um, moderate flow from the femoral or profunda due to post-thrombotic changes, and those that have really poor flow from their femoral with chronic post-thrombotic change down. All of the patients are going to get low molecular weight heparin, uh, one milligram per kilogram, Q12 hours for the first four weeks following treatment. And then where I differentiate and deviate is, do I add any platelets to that? In the moderate and high risk groups, I'll add any platelet agents. In the moderate risk group, I'll use aspirin alone, while in the high risk group, I'll add, do aspirin and Plavix for those patients in that first month. And then after that month is complete, I can convert all of these patients over to a direct oral anticoagulant. Um, it may be more shorter term in the low and moderate risk groups, but then indefinite in the high risk group. And then again, important to follow these patients with clinical follow-up as well as ultrasound at all these time points to assess how they're doing with these anticoagulations that we're choosing. Thanks so much. Ron, thanks. That was uh, a uh, great review of, of the state of the art. And I use the term art because as you point out, the science is still developing. Um, a question for the panel. So there's been some data that's been published uh, in the last few years to mimic some uh, warfarin data that came out maybe 10 or 15 years ago, that in the acute DVT patient, for example, you can treat them with anticoagulation for a period of time, maybe six months, maybe a year, somebody that may need to be on long-term anticoagulation because they've had multiple DVTs. Some of the recent data is, is mimicked, like I said, what, what was shown in warfarin that long-term, maybe after a year, a reduced dose uh, decreases the incidence of recurrent DVT, but also decreases the incidence of bleeding. And so a uh, um, question for, for the panel is, have you considered using a prophylactic dose of, if you're using warfarin, say an INR 1.5 to 2, or for the DOAX, a lower dose long-term? And, and if so, what, and, and then the other part of that question is, who do you keep on permanent anticoagulation? Ron's giving us some insight, so I'd like to see if the panel agrees. And then if you do do permanent anticoagulation, are you considering that lower dose maybe after a year? Aaron? Yeah, Paul, that's actually what, what I do. Um, so my very low risk patients, um, kind of to the left of that slide you showed, Ron, I use um, long-term aspirin. I typically still anticoagulate them that first six-month period. Um, and often those patients, I'll start off with just a prophylactic dose, you know, like the May Thurner type patient. I'm just being prophylactic until they kind of seal that stent off from their circulation. Um, and then I maintain them on an aspirin. The middle group, I usually will treat with a therapeutic um, DOEC for the first year or so, six months to a year. When I see that their stent is stable and it's well incorporated by that time and they're not getting any inflow issues, they don't have a lot of buildup in their stent, they don't have any clotting disorders, they're mobile, they don't really have any risk factors that make me particularly worried, I drop them to a prophylactic dose. Um, I will do ultrasound them a little more frequent right after the dose change, just to make sure nothing changed with their stent after. Um, and then the high risk group is where more, more often than not, they're on long-term therapeutic. Um, but occasionally if they're a high risk patient, elderly, other issues going on, history of GI bleeds, I will also drop them at one year, but just watch them a little closer. Ron, are you using the lower dose at all in your patients? Yeah, I agree with Aaron. I'm at the one year mark, I've started to consider the reduced intensity anticoagulation, the half dose Eliquis and Zarelto, um, just because of the, the studies that you described that have that clinical benefit with the reduced bleeding rate. So you're getting all of the reduction in recurrent DVT without any of the risk. So the way I present it to patients is you don't want to come back and have that procedure again, and you don't want us to have to reopen your stents. So I'd rather you take half dose anticoagulation and reduced dose, and it doesn't really have much of an increased bleeding risk from aspirin or baseline. Kathleen, besides the uh, question about the uh, diminished anticoagulation, you know, long-term, I also wondered if you could comment on, if you do use Lovenox or anoxaparin early on after an intervention, do you use the Q12 dosing as Ron mentioned, or do you ever use the uh, Q24 dosing? So um, I do a lot of the same things as Aaron and Ron, except for I will say with my uh, non-thrombotics, my Maytherners, I don't anticoagulate them with anything other than um, an antiplatelet agent. I don't put them on a DOAC or Lovenox if they haven't had a previous clot. Um, for my patients that have had a previous clot and that I put a stent in, 
or have recently had a clot, I do typically three weeks of Lovenox twice a day. The only time I've ever done once a day was recent where a patient said, I just cannot bring myself to do twice a day shot psychologically, but for some reason they could do it once a day. And I'm like, okay, we'll compromise. But otherwise I do twice a day Lovenox for three weeks um, until the last couple of years, I would then transition them to Coumadin. Um, but I don't do that anymore. I'm usually using Eliquis. Um, and then at one year, I switch them either to Xeralto or Eliquis at low dose, depending on whether they want to take a once a day or twice a day drug. And some also things with uh, digestive system, you know, Xeralto is absorbed in the stomach in the beginning of the small bowel and uh, Eliquis in the colon. So you don't want to use Eliquis if somebody's got colitis or problems with diarrhea, and you don't want to use Xeralto if they, for example, had a gastric bypass. So there's some tailoring you can do uh, with these drugs. But other than the fact that I don't, I only use antiplatelets if they have never had a clot before, I do a lot of the same things as the other panelists. Yeah, I do the same thing with post with non thrombotics. I'll anticoagulate during stent implantation, but then use antiplatelet therapy, typically aspirin, uh, in the post uh, procedure period. But yeah, and I I only do that for three months, and I'm not sure that it does anything other than you feel like you're doing something. I'm not sure they need it. They all they tend to do very well. Right. Um, the last question I have is uh, regarding the um, the intervention, if you find somebody on ultrasound where the stent in that follow-up period has some stuff in it. And, you know, there's been some discussion that this is kind of protein and platelet throm uh, buildup rather than actually cell buildup like you see in the arteries. Um, what's your threshold, Ron, for intervention uh, in those patients uh, and, and just monitor? And do you adjust medications to uh, to what you're seeing on ultrasound? It's a great question and a challenging one to answer. Um, I think it goes back to something we talked about at the very beginning that we have to gauge what we're going to do based on patient symptoms. And it really depends what they're presenting with. If I see a little bit of intimal hyperplasia or buildup within the stents on ultrasound and the patient's telling me, this is the best I felt. I'm more active than I've ever been. And thank you so much. I can't believe you're finding something in there. I'm not going to change anything. Um, but if their symptoms start to recur, if their swelling starts to recur, then I think it may be prudent to go in and try to address it before they get a complete occlusion. Aaron or Kathleen? Well, I think that that's right. Now, the, the difference that I see kind of now I'm, I'm having less problem with the night and all stents as I used to think that, um, or I would have patients where I wall stented them and I thought it was perfect. And then seeing the collapse at one end or the other uh, and seeing like a velocity change or something that was concerning and watch some that then occluded. So I think I, on those, I was more likely to re-intervene re and, you know, either put a Z-stent at the top if I hadn't or do something. And I'm finding I'm needing to do that less the ones I have trouble with is one that might be like a 50, 60% stenosis and some velocity change, but no symptoms. And I think we don't know. Um, you know, I haven't seen those go on to occlude, but it, it makes me nervous. So I don't have a really good answer. The discussion was uh, superb. And uh, I thank everybody for these excellent presentations tonight. You all did a, a superb job and uh i thank you for participating and i thank our audience for listening and uh and uh, hopefully uh, we all learned something from each other thank you very much